Good morning, church. Good morning, church. It's good to see you. You know, it's so great. We have so many people visiting. We have folks that move in and become a part of our church family. We're excited to have you. And every now and then, you know, someone has to move away. And so uh, I'm not sure how many more Sundays they'll be able to be with us, but Nick and Emily, the court, are sitting down here. They're leaving us. We're not going to uh, make you cry, but we're going to, you know, Ruthie will cry enough for everybody. Uh, but they're going to be moving uh, pretty soon. And so get a chance, hug their necks. Uh, they've been such a great soldiers for us working and here as well as university. And we appreciate everything you guys have done. We really do. Thank you so much. Well, we've been on this uh, series of uh, emojis, and today happens to be the one on fear. And so we took a few pictures of that uh, described this uh, being fearful or scary, and so I wanted to show you a couple of those. Uh, this first one uh, looks a little, I'm just scared to death type thing, right? You felt that before, somebody scares you, and you all of a sudden, then there's this one. Now, I don't know if he's scared or if he's scaring people. <laughs> and then there's this one among the young. <laughs> I love that one. Then there are those who try to be scary but can't. They're just cute, you know? <laughs> and then there are those who don't try to be scary, but they are. <laughs> so you've kind of got everything in between here at our church. So, uh, but this thing of fear, uh, we really wanted to talk about and see what Jesus said about it. You know... Fear happens to us sometimes, uh, uh, it's a sudden, abrupt thing that happens. Something just out of the circumstances that you're in from the outside startles you or scares you. That happens, uh, and, uh, 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 and we all understand that. But then there's also the constant fear from the inside that people have that they try to figure out how to live with. They're, they're scared of what someone will think about me. They're scared of, of am I going to lose my job? Am I going to, is this going to happen to me? Uh, they're scared, is a storm coming? They're scared, is this happening in my life? And they're, they're scared, is my marriage going to matter? So there's that underlying fear of almost everything they do, fear is attached to it. And there's that kind of, that, that's the kind where, you know, Jesus says, don't worry, right? I've got this thing. Seek first the kingdom, and, and I'm going to take care of you. There's that kind of fear that just permeates somebody's life, too. And so there's a little bit of that and kind of things in between when we talk about this idea called fear. I wanted to look at two stories uh, about uh, fear here uh, in the book of Matthew. And so uh, the first one's in Matthew chapter 8 and uh, verse 23. The Bible says this. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him, and suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up, and he rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now Jesus is with them. He's watched them do, uh, they've watched him do some great things. And now all of a sudden, even though he's there, they still don't quite understand who he is. And so it's like, who is this kind of guy that can just steal creation? Now let's look in Matthew chapter 14. Similar situation. In verse 22, you'll, many of you will remember this story. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, go ahead of them on the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went on the mountain by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. 
But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said, and Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. And everything was great for a while, right? But when he saw, when he saw the wind, he was afraid and he began and beginning to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were, with, uh, were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Now, did you notice the difference between the first story and the second? The first, they're afraid. And they call, by the way, you need to call on the right person. They call on Jesus, and they both say the same thing, both stories. Lord, save us. And then they watch and listen to Jesus as he, as he does this great miracle of calming the place, as he does this thing of saying, come out onto the water with me. And, and there's some belief to some degree, right? And Peter just jumps out there. But look, in the first story, they say, what kind of man is this? The second story, evidently they've grown in their faith because now they do what? They say, this is the Son of God and they worshiped him. I want to get to that point to where when things do scare me from time to time, my response is, hey, Jesus is in the boat. He's here. His presence is around. And my response is, he's the Son of God. Let's just go ahead and worship right now. That's where we want to get to, right? So, so when you're fearful, who, who do you call? And who do you listen to? And who will you believe? And then what, what will you say and do? You know, I think you're just like me. You looked around and you turned your TV on this last couple of weeks and you saw the violent killing of some young men. It, it breaks my heart. I'm not talking about just what's on the TV. I'm talking about what happens in our own Twin Cities. And then some guy takes a gun in Dallas, Texas and kills five men who were there to protect the people in that city. So I immediately got on Facebook, contacted a couple of friends I know over there who have family there that, that, that are serving the police. Are they okay? Yeah, they're fine. The messages come back. They're doing good. Okay. And you look at our nation and it's a little scary, isn't it? That things have turned so upside down in our country and in our community. And fear sits in. Who are you going to call? If we're calling anybody, if we're looking to anybody but Jesus to solve the hearts of murderous men then you're looking in the wrong place. Politicians will not be the answer. They will not. I'll tell you why they will not. Because they cannot give hope to people because they don't have any hope themselves. When, you're, when your leaders have lost character and godliness to that extreme, when that is a loss, then violence rises and ungodliness rises. And the church has a responsibility to speak the word of God into the life of our communities and our neighbors and our cities and our government. And we must quit worrying about our own rights and worry about our own responsibilities. As God's people, we take that we take the bull by the horns and we say we've got something better to offer you than running down here in the neighborhood and shooting each other. 
We've got a better answer for your problems. We've got a better, a, a better resolution to the, to, the, to the unrest that's going on in your heart and your life. And we, the church, have good answers for people in bad situations. Don't look for help anywhere else. And if God uses them, and he will, and he'll, he'll use them however he wants to, and we'll praise him for when he does. But look, I am not looking for salvation, hope, and peace outside of Jesus Christ. It doesn't exist. We look at the violence, and I t it breaks my heart. There is a violent act of injustice that needs to be examined. One in particular above all else. And it's the violence and the injustice that took place at the cross. For there was a violent act. There was an injustice. And it happened because of my sin and yours. There's the violence that ought to be investigated by uh, everyone that wants to figure out how to solve violence. You investigate that violent act and you'll find your answer to the violence in our communities. That's the one violent story that needs to be investigated, examined, and told over and over again. For when Jesus hung on the cross, he wasn't looking out among the crowd desiring to see men carrying posters protesting the injustice of his death. He was on the cross looking out over a crowd saying, God, forgive them for what they do. Understand? Forgive them. That same amount of love for people who do wrong to anybody ought to come out of God's church. And I'm gonna, let me just go ahead and say this. If you're, getting, if you're speaking ungodly things, whether it's by your mouth or whether it's by social media, and you're God's child, you quit it right now. You quit taking sides. That ain't right. Look, the media is going to blow up extremes. They're going to show the most extreme case of anything and cause divide. God's people is not about pulling people apart. We're about bringing people together. And that can't happen if you're out there running your mouth on social media, demonizing all kinds of situations. Don't, you don't have the answers to injustice. God does. So don't act like you do. Then I say that any stronger? Just stay off the stinking internet. That, that's, that's Greek for bad. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the Latin word there, Al. Did you catch that Latin word? I don't know. I don't know how to, to get. Look, if I could make everybody act right, I'd be good. You know, someone said, Mike, you know, y'all got preachers. Y'all have a lot of power. Are you kidding? If I could make everybody act right, I would. If I could make everybody give 10%, I would, Al. You know, I mean, right? <laughs> the only power to change the actions of men are found in the power of the gospel. And as God's church, we are to emulate and imitate the life of Christ. So I'll tell you what you do. You get out your Bible and you start looking at how he handled Ungodliness, injustice, loving the enemies, hating what's evil, clinging to what's good. You look at Jesus and how he treated people, and you treat people the way he did, and I promise you, you'll be on the right track. And look, it's not about religion. It's not, it's not about race. So I said, Mike, you can't understand. You're a white man. You're right. I don't have to understand. Jesus understands. When I follow him, I'm not going to get off course too much, you see. I've got a man named Jesus. 
And he understands every race. He created the human race and loves all men, no matter what color. And by the way, we must too. And help encourage all men. What's our, what's our goal then? What do we walk out of here with? Here's what I want you to take home. In your fear, the words of Jesus to those disciples are the words to us. Have faith. Trust God and what he said. He's big enough to handle this problem. And whether our nation rises to be a great nation again in upholding godly truths, I pray it does. I pray for revival all the time. Or whether God tears it down, look, my citizenship is in heaven. And while I'm here, I'm going to try to take as many people to heaven as I possibly can with me. That's our goal as a church. And that's why preaching the gospel is the only answer to the evil that men do, whether it's in this country or any other country that ever has existed or will exist, the hope of man always is found, his hope is always found in the one man, God man, Christ Jesus our Lord. That's where hope is found. So what do we do? We put faith in that. We trust him. I know this is kind of a set-up question. What did you do most this week? Read your Bible or watch the news? Ne- never mind, never mind. We'll just all, we'll just all together repent. Okay, well, can we just do that? We'll just all together do that. Because who do you listen to, you see? Because that determines many times what we say. The next thing we need to do as a church, we need to speak Life. Speak life. Politicians can't do this because they don't have it. Speak life. We must be willing to speak life into the poor neighborhoods of our cities, regardless of race, religion, or sinfulness. Speak life. Speak life to a hopeless and fearful world. They need it. Speak life. Speak life when violence is all around us. Speak life when we're hurt and burdened. Speak life when a brother stumbles and falls, and he will, pick him up and speak life. When your marriage is weak, speak life. When you're sick and diseased, speak life. When the night is long and dark and lonely because of grief, speak life. When the mornings break with new mercies, Speak life and recognize where they come from. When joys abound and blessings are, speak life and give God the glory. When the world mistreats you and abuses you, speak life. Remember the Son of God and speak life. Remember the blood of the Lamb and speak life. Remember the empty tomb and speak life. Remember one day He's coming back again and speak life. Speak life. Speak life out loud, on purpose, without fear, without compromise. We are a church that will speak life. And you cannot speak what you do not have. So if your boat's been rocked around by a few winds and waves this week, It's okay. You know who to call. Listen to his words about having faith. Worship him. He's the son of God. And speak life to those around you. Father, we love you. We pray desperately for our country. Injustices just furiate us. I don't expect the world to act like your church. And neither do I expect your church to act like the world. Father, give us the wisdom and the determination 
to speak words of life into our neighborhoods, into our coworkers, that we would stay away from any language that infuriates, any language that rises up, raises up violence or ugliness, that our language would be a language of healing and peace because we bring the words of Jesus to people's life. Help us to not get caught up in the rhetoric. Help us to stand up for the things that you've said to respect. Help us to respect life. Help us to respect those in authority and to live in harmony and in power as much as possible, Father, promoting peace and the good news of Jesus. Father, I I repent for our nation who has turned morality upside down. I pray for revival in the hearts of men and women. I pray, Father, that you do whatever it takes to turn people back to you, to be conscious of your greatness, of your love, and of your sacrifice. May we never forget the violent death of your son and that great injustice that took place so that I could live forever. Thank you for your grace. May we learn better how to be people that are salt and light in a world that needs it so desperately. I thank you, Father, for the brothers here. I've heard of many people uh, uh, being baptized this week, folks calling on Jesus, people sharing the good news, and and, uh, help us never to get off track and off focus, Father, what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you for that. And bless us to be strong and courageous. Your people, a shining light in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a need to respond, we just want you to be right with the Lord. Don't walk out of here not knowing you're right with God. Come all together we stand and sing.